the tower. The road begins to rise in a series of gentle curves, passing through pleasing groves of olives and vines. Five kilometres on the left is the fork for Florence. To the right may be seen the Tower of Sacrifice, 470 steps, built in 1535 by Niccolò di Ferramano. Superstitious fear left the tower intact when in 1549 the surrounding village was completely destroyed. Triumphantly, Caroline lifted her finger from the fine italic type. There was nothing to mar the success of this afternoon. Not only had she taken out the car alone for the first time, driving unerringly on the right-hand side of the road, but what she had achieved was not just a simple drive, but a cultural excursion. She had taken the Italian guidebook that Neville was always urging on her unhesitatingly, haltingly. She had managed to piece out enough of the language to choose a route that took in four well-thought-of frescoes, two universally admired campanile, and a wooden crucifix in a village church quite a long way from the main road. It was not, after all, such a bad thing that the British Council meeting had kept Neville in Florence, True, he was certain to know all about the Campanile and the frescoes, but there was just a chance that he hadn't discovered the crucifix. And how gratifying if she could at least have something of her own to contribute to his constantly accumulating hoard of culture. But could she still add more? There was at least another hour of daylight and it wouldn't take more than 35 minutes to get back to the flat in Florence. Perhaps there would be just time to add this tower to her dutiful collection. What was it called? She bent her head to the guidebook again, carefully tracing the text with her finger to be sure she was translating it correctly word for word. But this time her moving finger stopped abruptly at the name Niccolò di Ferramano. There had risen in her mind a picture, no not a picture, portrait of a thin white face with deep set black eyes that stared intently into hers. Why portrait? she asked and then she remembered. It had been about three months ago just after they were married when Neville had first brought her to Florence. He himself had already lived there for two years and during that time it had he had been at least as concerned to accumulate Tuscan culture for himself as to disseminate English culture to the Italians. What would be more natural than wishing to share, perhaps even to show off, his discoveries to his young wife? Caroline had come out to Italy with the idea that when she had worked through one or two galleries and made a few trips to, say, Assisi and Siena, that she would have done her duty as a British council wife and could then settle down to examine the Florentine shops, which everyone told her was too, were too marvellous for words. But Neville had been contemptuous of her programme. You can see the stuff in the galleries at any time, he had said, but I'd like you to start with pieces the ordinary tourist doesn't see. And of course, Caroline couldn't possibly let herself be classed as an ordinary tourist. She had been proud to accompany Neville to castles and palaces privately owned to which his work gave him entry and there to gaze with what she hoped was pleasure on the undiscovered Raphael, the Titian that hung on the same wall ever since it was painted, the Giotto fresco under which the family who had originally commissioned it still said their prayers. It had been on one of these pilgrimages that she had seen the face of the young man with the black eyes. They had made the long, slow drive over narrow, ill-made roads and at last had come to a castle on the top of a hill. The family was, to Neville's disappointment, away, but the housekeeper remembered him and led them to a long gallery lined with five centuries of family portraits. Though she could not have admitted it even to herself, Caroline had become almost anaesthetised to Italian art. Dutifully. She had followed Neville along the gallery and listened politely to his light, well-bred voice. He had told her intimate anecdotes of history and involuntarily she had let her eyes wander around the room, glancing anywhere but 
at the particular portrait of Neville's immediate dissertation. It was thus that her eye was caught by a face on the other side of the room, and forgetting what was due to politeness, caught her husband's arm and demanded, Neville, who's that girl over there? But he was pleased with her. He said, ah, I'm glad you picked that one out. It's generally thought to be the best thing in the collection. A bronzino, of course. And they went over to look at it. The picture was painted in rich, pale colours. A green curtain, a blue dress, a young face with calm brown eyes and plaits of honey gold hair. Caroline read the name underneath the picture. Giovanna di Ferramano, 1531 to 1549. That was the year the village was destroyed, she remembered, now sitting in the car by the roadside. At the time, she had exclaimed, oh, Neville, she was only 18 when she died. They married young in those days, Neville commented, and Caroline said in surprise, oh, was she married? It had been the radiantly virginal character of the face that had caught her attention. Yes, she was married, Neville answered and added, look at the portrait beside her. It's Bronzino again. What do you think of it? And this was when Caroline had seen the pale young man. There were no clear light colours in this picture. There was only the whiteness of his face and the blackness of his eyes and hair and clothes and the glint of gold letters on the pile of books under which the young man rested his hand. Underneath the picture was written portrait of an unknown gentleman. Do you mean he's her husband? Caroline asked. Surely they'd know if he was, instead of calling him an unknown gentleman. He is Niccolo di Ferramano, all right, said Neville. I've seen another portrait of him somewhere, and it's not a face one would forget. But, he added reluctantly, because he hated to admit ignorance, there's apparently some weird scandal about him, and though they don't turn his picture out, they won't even mention his name. Last time I was here... The old count himself took me through the gallery. I asked him about little Giovanna and her husband. He laughed uneasily. Mind you, my Italian was far from perfect at that time, but it was horribly clear that I shouldn't have asked. But what did he say? Caroline demanded. I remember, said Neville, for some reason it stuck in my mind. He said either she was lost or she was damned. But which word it was, I can never be sure. The portrait of Niccolo he'd just ignored altogether. What was wrong with Niccolo, I wonder, mused Caroline, and Neville answered. I don't know, but I can guess. Do you notice the lettering on those books up there under his hand? It's all in Hebrew or Arabic. Undoubtedly, the unmentionable Niccolo dabbled in black magic. Caroline shivered. I don't like him, she said. Let's look at Giovanna again. And they moved back to the first portrait and Neville said casually, do you know, she's rather like you. I've just got time to look at the tower now, Caroline said aloud. And she put the guidebook back in the pigeonhole under the dashboard and drove carefully along the gentle curves until she came to the fork for Florence on the left. On the top of the little hill to the right stood a tall round tower. There was no other building in sight. In a land where every available piece of ground is cultivated, there was no cultivated land around this tower. On the left was the fork for Florence. On the right, a rough track led up to the top of the hill. Caroline knew that she wanted to take the fork to the left, to Florence, and home, and Neville, and a sudden urgent voice inside her said, for safety. The voice so much shocked her that she got out of the car and began to trudge up the dusty track to the tower. After all, I may not come this way again, she argued. It seems silly to miss the chance of seeing it when I've already got a reason for being interested. I'm only just going to have a quick look. She glanced at the setting sun, telling herself that she would indeed have to be quick if she were to get back to Florence before dark. And now she had climbed the hill and was standing in front of the tower. 
It was built of narrow red bricks and only thin slits pierced its surface right up to the top where Caroline could see some kind of narrow platform encircling it. Before her was an arched doorway. I'm just going to have a quick look, she assured herself again. And then she walked in. She was in an empty room with a low arched ceiling and a narrow stone staircase clung to the wall and circled round the room to disappear through a hole in the ceiling. There ought to be a wonderful view at the top, said Caroline firmly to herself, and she laid her hand on the rusty rail and started to climb. And as she climbed, she counted. 39, 40, 41, she said, and with the 41st step, she came through the ceiling and saw over her head, far, far above the deepening blue sky, a small circle of blue framed in the narrowing shaft round which the narrow staircase spiralled. There was no wall on the inside of the staircase, only the rusty rail protected the climber. 83, 84, counted Caroline. The sky above her was losing its colour and she wondered why the narrow slit windows in the wall had been so placed so that they spiralled around the staircase, too high for anyone climbing it to see through them. It's getting dark very quickly, said Caroline at the 150th step. I know what the tower is like now. It would be much more sensible to give up and go home. At the 269th step, her hand moving forward on the railing met only empty space. For an interminable second, she shivered, pressed back onto the br hard brick on the other side. Then hesitantly, she groped forward and upwards, and at last, two fingers met the rusty rail again, and again she climbed. But now the breaks in the rail became more and more frequent. Sometimes she had to climb several steps with her left shoulder pressed tightly to the brick wall before her searching hand could find the tenuous rusty comfort again. At the 375th step, the rail, as the moving hand clutched it, crumpled away under her fingers. I'd better just go by the wall, she told herself. And now her left hand traced the rough brick as she climbed up and up. 422, 423, counted Caroline with part of her brain. I really ought to go down now, said another part. I wish, oh, I want to go down now, but she could not. It'd be silly to give up, She's, she told herself, desperately trying to rationalise what drove her on, just because one's afraid, and then she had to stifle that thought too. There was nothing left in her brain but the steadily mounting tally of steps. 470, said Caroline aloud with explosive relief. And then she stopped abruptly because the steps had stopped too. There was nothing ahead but a piece of broken railing barring her way. The sky was now drained of all its colour and the walls still extended some 20 feet above her head. But how idiotic! She said into the air, the whole thing's absolutely pointless. And then the fingers of her left hand exploring the wall beside her met not brick, but wood. She turned to see what it was, and there in the wall, level with the top step, was a small wooden door. So it does go somewhere after all, she said, and fumbled with the rusty handle. The door pushed open and she stepped through. She was on a narrow stone platform about a yard wide. It seemed to encircle the tower. The platform sloped downwards away from the tower and its stones were smooth and very shiny. And this was all she noticed before she looked beyond the stones and down. She was immeasurably, unbelievably high and alone. And the ground below was a world away. It was not credible, not possible that she should be so far from the ground. All her being 
was suddenly absorbed in the single impulse to hurl herself from the sloping platform. I cannot go down any other way, she said, and then she heard what she said and she stepped back, frenziedly clutching the soft rotten wood of the doorway with hands sodden with sweat. There is no other way, said the voice in her brain. There, there is, is no, no other, other way. way. This is vertigo, said Caroline. I've only just got to close my eyes and keep still for a minute and it will pass. It's bound to pass. I've never had it before, but I know what it is and it's vertigo. She closed her eyes and kept very still and felt this cold sweat running down her body. <sighs> I should be all right now, she said at last, and carefully she stepped back through the doorway onto the 470th step and pulled the door shut before her. She looked up at the sky, swiftly darkening with night. Then for the first time, she looked down the shaft in the tower. Down the narrow, unprotected staircase, spiralling round and round and round and disappearing into the dark. She, she screamed, I can't go down. She stood still on the top step, staring downwards and slowly the last light faded from the tower. She could not move. It was impossible that she dare go down step by step, down the unprotected stairs into the dark below. It, it would be much be easier, easier to fall, said the voice in her head, to, to take one step to the left and fall, and it would all be over. You cannot climb down. She began to cry, shuddering with the pain of her sobs. It could not be true that she had brought herself to this peril and that there could be no safety for her and that she was facing climbing down these menacing stairs. The reality must be she was safe at home with Neville. But this was the reality and here were the stairs. At last she stopped crying, said, now I shall go down. One, she counted her right hand tearing at the brick wall. First she moved one, then the other foot down to the second step. Two, she counted, and then she thought of the depth below her and stood still stupefied with terror. The stone beneath her feet, the brick against her hand, were two frail protections for her exposed body. They could not save her from the voice that repeated it would be easier to fall. Abruptly she sat down on the step. Two, she counted again, and spreading both her hands tightly against the step on either side of her, she swung her body off the second step down onto the third. Three, she counted, then four, then five, pressing close, close into the wall, away from the empty drop on the other side. At the twenty-first step, she said, I think I can do it now. She slid her right hand up the rough wall and stood slowly upright. Then with her other hand, she reached for the railing. It was now too dark to see, but it was not there. For timeless time, she stood there knowing nothing but fear. 21, she said, 21, over and over again, but she could not step onto the 22nd stair. Something brushed her face. She knew it was a bat and not a hand but that touched her, but still it was horror beyond conceivable horror. And it was this horror without any sense of moving from dread to safety that at last compelled her down the stairs. 23, 24, 25, she counted. And around her the air was full of whispering skin-stretched wings. If one of them should touch her again, she must fall. 26, 27, 28. The skin of her right hand was torn and hot with blood for she would never lift it from the wall only press it slowly down and force her rigid legs to move from the knowledge of each step to the peril of the next so caroline came down the tower she could not think she could know nothing but fear only her brain remorselessly recorded the tally 501 it counted 502, 
and full.